I read in the Record Eagle that there would be a woman here speaking at TED who had sailed around the world. And when I read that, my first thought was, I can't wait to meet her. I have so many questions. <laughs> but of course, I read a little bit further, and it said that that woman was me, and my next thought was, oh boy, I have a lot of sailing to do before TED. <laughs> The truth is I have done a lot of sailing, but I haven't sailed around the world yet. Although it's on my life list, and I, and I brought that list with me to share with you today. I began keeping lists when I was very young. I listed everything, and I wrote it all down in this little notebook that I called my book of lists. In it, I listed my best friend's names, my doll's names, every book I ever read. This list is titled, What I Want to Be When I Grow Up. It says, dancer, writer, explorer, ghostbuster. <laughs> this list is titled, Things to Remember When You Become a Grown-Up. One, never tell a kid it's only puppy love. Kids can be heartbroken too. Two, be poor but happy. I think that was my way of reminding myself not only to be happy with whatever I had in life, but to be even happier by desiring less. And that's the sentiment that I carry with me today in my exploration of simple living. It began in 2008 when I was teaching at a boarding school and dreaming of the day that I would someday live on a boat and sail to all the mysterious and exciting places in the world. I wanted to live on a North Sea, which is a small 27-foot sailboat that my father had told me about when I was very young. I still have the brochure from the 1970s, and on the cover it features a man in tight yellow shorts sitting at the helm and gazing off into the sunset. I found out a North Sea had been listed for sale, and I immediately began thinking of all the reasons why I couldn't buy this boat. I hadn't saved enough money. I didn't have a plan for a job while I was living aboard. I didn't know how to take care of a boat, and I had never sailed solo before. But before I got too carried away with the reasons why I couldn't buy this boat, I had to remind myself of something that I teach my students, and that is when you dream of something, instead of thinking, why not, just decide to do it and make a plan to make it work out later. So it was a Monday when I found out this was for sale, and on Tuesday I made an offer. On Wednesday I took out a loan, on Thursday I forwarded the down payment, and on Friday I was driving to Pennsylvania to see for the first time what would be home to myself and my cat. In just one week I went from dreaming to doing, to saying, someday I will, to saying, I am. And all it took was a little change of heart and a little courage. For the next few years, I lived and traveled on that boat, which I named Daphne after my grandmother, and here it is right here, shown actual size. <laughs> <laughs> there were times when it was a struggle, but there were also some amazing times as well. The ocean is one of the last truly wild places on Earth. It's unaltered like it was thousands of years ago. Thoreau says that men go back to the mountains as sailors go back to ships at sea because it's in the mountains and it's on the sea that we must face up. When I moved aboard, I started a blog called Sailing Simplicity in the Pursuit of Happiness, and very quickly more and more people started reading my blog, and I began to receive letters and emails from readers. One woman wrote to me and explained that she and her husband had just purchased a sailboat that they take out on the lake sailing. And when the wind picks up, the boat starts to lean over, to heel over. And she knows this is very natural for a sailboat, but it frightens her. She says when that happens, she freaks out, and her husband kind of saves the day and makes her feel calm again. So she wrote to me and asked me, uh, how do I overcome this fear so I can sail the boat like you do? And I thought about this for a while because I'm, I'm often afraid on my boat as well. Fear isn't overcome, it's managed. Just about a year ago, I was sailing across the Gulf Stream. There was no land in sight, and there wouldn't be for a while. Um, it was a calm, sunny day, the breeze was steady, and every once in a while I would stand up and I'd do a routine scan of the horizon. And um, on this time I stood up, and as I scanned the horizon, suddenly there, off the stern of my boat, I saw a water spout. A water spout is a tornado on the water. Sometimes they're so small, you could sail right up to them and not be affected at all. Other times, they're large, they, and they're so big that if you got near them, they would knock your boat over, if you're lucky, because they just might carry your boat up and t pick your boat up and carry it away. This water spout was huge. I could see it reach from the sea, floor, the sea to the sky, and the, 
the spray and the wind was a swirling funnel of wind, uh, sorry, wind and sea spray, and I could see it tower above me, taller than a city skyline. Water spouts paths are unpredictable, and I didn't know what this water spout was going to do. And sometimes they diminish, and sometimes they grow larger. My heart dropped to my knees when I saw that water spout. And this is the moment where fear can take over, or it can be managed. The first thing I did was take my cat and secure him in the cabin below. <laughs> then I moved about the, about the boat, and I secured everything else. I sealed up all the ports and the hatches. I lashed everything to the deck, and then I checked my own tether to the boat. I saw 14 water spouts that day. It's certainly not a day that I would wish for, but it's something that I do go to sea for. Um, it's what I definitely had bargained for when I purchased that boat. We're led to believe that security, comfort, and stability is a good life, but I think it's hazardous to our character and to our spirit. I think at some point we have to come face to face with the most primitive circumstances where there's nothing to help us but the wit in our own head and the courage in our own heart and the strength in our own hands. It's in those moments when we realize that there is more to us than we ever thought there was. And so when that woman wrote to me and asked, how do I overcome this fear and sail the boat like you do, I replied simply, you have to take the boat out sailing alone. <laughs> Since I began really exploring and trying to understand simple living or voluntary simplicity, I keep coming back to the same two questions, and I'm going to ask you those questions today. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about voluntary simplicity. One of the biggest misconceptions of voluntary simplicity is that it's easy or it alleviates burdens. That's not always true, and that's not the goal of simple living. The goal of sim simple living is a values-based lifestyle that counts creativity, knowledge, experiences, family and community higher than things like wealth, appearances, property, reputation. It's unique and personal, individual to each person exploring that lifestyle. Let's think about this again. It's a values-based lifestyle with priorities other than wealth, power, property, and reputation. Yet interestingly enough, those four qualities embody today's customary idea of success. When you think of a former classmate or a friend who has gone on to be successful, aren't those the first qualities that come to mind? Aristotle defined those four qualities as the external goods. He also identified the goods of the soul, being courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom. In 1981, Duane, Duane Elgin wrote a very influ influential book on this subject. And he, said, and he reflected Aristotle's thoughts on external goods and the internal goods of the soul when he said that voluntary simplicity is a way of living that is outwardly simple but inwardly rich. But again, today's discussion of voluntary simplicity, interestingly enough, places a greater emphasis on reducing those external goods rather than cultivating the internal ones. There's a lot of media, a lot of self-help books, a lot of web resources that talk about downsizing or reducing debt or getting rid of your extra things. But in order to reduce, we have to live in excess already. Sure, we can donate close to goodwill or we can live without a television, but most of what we spend isn't on unnecessary things. Most of the middle class income is spent on meeting our basic needs, such as health care, food, housing, education, or a car. For example, advocates of voluntary simplicity suggest that we live without a car and we walk, bike, or take a bus to work. Is this really realistic for everybody? How many of you could take a bus to work? If we insist that everybody lives without a car, that uh, jobs are already hard enough to come by, but I, by insisting that, then we greatly reduce our options. Voluntary simplicity also values extremely meaningful work over extremely lucrative work. But again, by, if you, by pursuing a dream of, say, starting a small business, then you greatly compromise your ability to provide health care for your family. So the first question that I'm going to ask you that I often ask myself is, our country really simplicity friendly? The Declaration of Independence states that our inalienable rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They're universal and they're legal. They're for everyone and they're facilitated by our government. They're the foundation of the American dream. 
which has had many meanings over the years. Long ago, it meant that people could own property. Some say it's a promise of security and comfort, and others say it's a promise of wealth and material abundance. James Truslow Adams popularized the phrase in 1931, and he says, it has been a dream of being able to grow to the fullest development as a man and a woman. And that brings me to the second question that I often ask myself, are we really free to grow to the fullest development as a man and a woman? I often think about those rights in the Declaration, in particular happiness and how it relates to simplicity. Just four years ago, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention announced that the number one prescription drug in America has become antidepressants. That certainly says something about ourselves and our neighbors, and that's only for the people that can actually afford prescription drugs. So because these are all questions that I continue to explore, I decided to title my blog, Sailing Simplicity in the Pursuit of Happiness, to play on those inalienable rights and the evolving American dream. My dream is to live in a country where people can choose simplicity if they desire, where they have access to the public goods and services that help us meet our basic needs, even if we make an only modest income. Because let's face it, most of us work very hard for a modest income. My hope is that our, our leaders will cultivate a country with simplicity in their hearts, where people can choose to live simply if they desire. Thank you.